is defined as having the mental and moral strength to venture, persevere, and withstand danger, fear, and difficulties. In our lesson today, the prophet Elijah shows us that it will take courage to walk on our salvation and do the will of our Heavenly Father. Hey, I'm Minister Adam, and Sunday School is now in session. Welcome to JCC's Sunday School Lesson for March 28, 2021. The title of this International Sunday School Lesson in Boyd's Commentary, as well as Towson's Press and the National Sunday School Commentary is Elijah, the Prophet of Courage. Hey, if you enjoy our lesson, please let us know by liking, commenting, subscribing, and hitting the little bell to be notified when we post each week. To find out more about Jordan Christian Center, a virtual ministry aiming to transform lives by equipping, educating, empowering, as well as encouraging the world, please visit us at jordanchristiancenter.com. Let's get into our lesson today. The unifying topic for our lesson is the bearer of bad news. And our scripture will be coming from 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 5 through 18. Our main thought will be coming from 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 18. And as we do each week, we'll be reading from the New Living Translation of the Bible. And it read, I made no trouble for Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commandments of the Lord and have worshipped the, the images of Baal instead. The aim of our lesson today is by the end of this lesson, we will compare Elijah's response to speak to Ahab to that of Obadiah's response to report back to Ahab. Gain a sense of Obadiah's concern when reporting Elijah's message to Ahab and act in boldness when speaking the word of God. Now, as we do each week, we'll start off our lesson today with a little bit of background. Now, we're in the fourth lesson of this unit that's titled Faithful Prophets. And how mighty, how mighty have our prophets been so far? We've been talking about Moses and Joshua and so on and so forth. This week, we'll be in the book of First King. And the author of First King is unknown, though many scholars believe that it was Jeremiah, along with several other prophets who wrote it. Now, 1 King is centered around how this once great kingdom of Israel was divided into two parts, yet God was still there to oversee them as their spiritual leader. So whether they were south in the um, southern kingdom of Judah or the northern kingdom of Israel, they still believed in God, though they sinned quite frequently and God ended up having to kick them out of the promised land. But this book trails the kings or have tells of the kings of Israel. Some worshiped the Lord as commanded, while others were led, led the people astray and worshiped small G gods, such as Baal, the God we're going to be talking about today. The mega theme of um, First Kings is, first of all, we're talking about the kings and, and their plight. It, it, their plight actually helps us understand that wisdom, power and achievement doesn't uh, it doesn't ultimately come from a human source. It comes from God. We know that Solomon in um, First King, he built the temple. And this really taught us that, you know, it doesn't matter how beautiful the worship house is. If we don't, it, it won't guarantee that there will be a heartfelt worship in the house of God. This goes to show us that even in our churches today, if, if it's not about God, if it's about anything or any other person other than God, then is it a worship center at all? The other the mega theme when it comes to first Kings was sin and repentance. See, God gave all these Kings the same commandment and he used priests as well as prophets to steer them in the right direction. But each of them, each of these Kings, they sinned. The difference was some of them repented from the evil ways while others did not. But we find here the ones that repented, God forgave them, healed the land, when they were willing to do what God want them to do. Just as it is with us today, when we do the will of God, God blesses us and, and, and prospers us. Now they may not be in money and fortune, but isn't peace a part of prosperity? Isn't joy a huge part of prosperity? So though we may not have the money we want and the cars and the clothes, if we can have the peace and joy of God, 
Isn't that enough? And when that's enough for us, we will find that we can find solace in our God. Now, leading up to today's lesson, King Ahab became the king of Israel. He marries Jezebel, Jezebel, and she worshiped a swarm of gods and goddesses. Chief among these gods were Baal. Now, the general term for Baal is, is, is Lord, and is given to um, the, the god of uh, fertility and the agricultural god of the Canaanites. So as uh, Ahab and um, Jezebel, while they were worshiping um, Baal among all these other gods, it turned the the Israelites away from God. It turned the northern kingdom of Israel away from God because of all these gods and idols and all this stuff that Jezebel brought into the kingdom. But we can't let Ahab off the hook. He was right there and he allowed it. In fact, the Bible says that King Ahab did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any other king before him. And that's saying a lot. Meanwhile, Elijah, whose name means Yahweh is God, he comes on the scene here in 1 Kings, seemingly suddenly to appear um, as Ahab took reign. Now, according to um, 1 Kings chapter 17, 1, Elijah told the king that as surely as the, uh, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God that he served, there will be no dew or rain during the next years until I give word. Those are some strong words. You're talking about courage. Uh, Elijah marches into the king's throne there and tell him this. That's something else. But after he told the king this, we find that Elijah went east to a place where no one could find him but God. And while he was there, God provided him with food and water, whether it was the ravens bringing it to him or a widow cooking for him. God provided for him while he was out there after he took the courage to tell the king what thus says the Lord. Here we find that three years into the drought, God sent Elijah back to visit King Ahab. And this is where our lesson picks up today in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses five and six, which says, Ahab said to Obadiah, we must check every spring and valley in the land to see if we can find enough grass to save at least some of my horses and mules. Verse six said, so they divided the land between them. Ahab went one way by himself and Obadiah went the other way by himself. Here we find that after three years of the drought, the land was in a serious condition. But what's interesting here is um, King Ahab, he wasn't concerned about the, the, the people of Israel. He was concern, concerned about his horses and his mules and, and so on and so forth. And according to the scripture, he had quite a few of them. So in this desperate state, Ahab sent, uh, went along with his trusted governor of his house, Obadiah. Now, Obadiah here, we find that he's a servant of the Lord and the one and only God, not Baal, but the only God, the only living God. So um, Ahab has Obadiah go along with him. Obadiah, it means servant of Jehovah. So perhaps Ahab had him, uh, you know, had Obadiah in this place of authority because he knew this was an honest, God-fearing man. Even though he wasn't, even though he turned away as a king from God, he must have recognized that Obadiah was a man of God. So what better person can you trust than a man of God? That's really how, if we're walking in the light, people should trust us. People should um, believe in us because of how we carry ourselves, because of who we believe in. The king more than likely, he, he felt that Obadiah definitely would come back and report if he in fact found something in the pasture that he could use to feed his flock. Now, somebody else, Hmm. They might have found this pastor and, and, and sold it to the highest bidder. But he knew Obadiah for whatever reason. He knew he was an honest man. So he went one way and Obadiah went the other way. Now, Obadiah here, he shows us that just because we work for a corrupt person, it doesn't mean we have to be corrupt. It doesn't mean that we have to do the things that they do. In fact, when we walk in light we will get recognized by those who are in the dark for being trustworthy because of who we trust in. 
So brothers and sisters, if you're out there and you're working for somebody that nah, their morals may not be there, whether you stop working for them or not, that's between you and, and, and whatever um, um, you believe in that particular situation. But the one thing I know for sure is don't let them corrupt you. Don't let them take you out of where God is trying to take you. That's very important. So now as we move down to verses 7 through 14, it reads, As Obadiah was walking along, long, he suddenly saw Elijah coming towards him. Obadiah recognized him at once and bowed down below to the ground before him. He said, Is it really you, my lord Elijah? He asked. Yes, it is, Elijah replied. Now go and tell your master, Elijah is here. Oh, sir, Obadiah protested, what harm have I done to you that you would send me to my death at the hand of Ahab? For I swear by the Lord your God that the king is searching, has searched every nation, every kingdom on this earth from end to end to find you. And each time he was told Elijah is not there. King Ahab forced the king that, uh, of that nation to swear to the truth of his claim. And now you say, go tell your master Elijah is here. But as soon as I leave you, the spirit of Lord will carry you away to who knows where. When Ahab come to find you, he will kill me. Yet I have been a true servant of the Lord all my life. Has no one told you, my Lord, about the time Jezebel was trying to kill the Lord's prophet? I hid a hundred of them in two caves and supplied them with food and water. And you say, go tell your master, Elijah here is here. Sir, if I do that, Ahab will certainly kill me. As Obadiah headed one way from King and, and, and King Ahab headed the other way, he runs into the ever elusive Elijah. And when he recognized that this was the prophet Elijah, he fell on his knees before him. Now, it's important to note that Obadiah's action was not one of worship of Eli, but out of respect. He recognized that Elijah was a man of God. And this respect was given to Elijah out of Obadiah's fear of the Lord. It was an honor that's given to one of God's extraordinary ambassador. So Elijah asked him to go tell the king or give a king of a message and Obadiah was kind of like I don't know about that and Obadiah had some very valid reasons why he didn't want to go back and tell the king that he had ran into Elijah moreover to bring the king to um, Elijah the first one was the fact that the king had searched high and low for Elijah even going into other countries making kings of other countries swear that they, they had neither seen nor are they harboring Elijah and surely if the king had found out that someone was harboring Elijah then the king Ahab he, he probably would have killed him also King Ahab when he went to these um cities the reason he's went because somebody would say oh Elijah might have been seen here or he was seen there but when the king arrived Elijah was nowhere to be found so Obadiah is saying that if he go tell the king that um, Elijah is here, how do you know Elijah is going to be there? So the king may just kill him on the spot saying, you're lying. Why would he be right here and kill him there? That, that's a pretty valid reason. The other reason was Elijah had a reputation of being very elusive. elusive. We find that the kings, again, searched high and low for him for three years and could not find him anywhere. O o o Obadiah understood that the Lord God had to have a special uh, anointing on Elijah. And from his perspective, how did he know God wouldn't just come and swoop in and, and sweep um, Elijah up and take him elsewhere while he's going to tell the king that Elijah is here? Meanwhile, we find that Obadiah might have been stuck holding the bag. At that time, if he told the king that Elijah was there and God swooped Elijah away and he come back and, and Elijah's not there, uh, then surely the king would have killed Obadiah. But while speaking to with Elijah, it's not just about, you know, the king would kill him. Uh, Obadiah wanted to also prove that he did love the Lord, that, that he did have courage. In fact, he wanted to say, hey, I hid uh, over a hundred prophets in two different caves because the king's wife, um, Jezebel was trying to kill them. That could have led to my demise. 
That, that's what he's saying. That I could have, I could have been killed if she had found out about that. Surely she would have killed me. I have courage, man, but um, I, I don't know if I can do this. Clearly, Obadiah is saying to Elijah, "I love the Lord, and I'm willing to to be His vessel. But what you asking me to do can lead to my death." And see, brothers and sisters, we all will face a time in our life when we have to trust God over what we know from our past and what we see in our presence. We may have failed in our past lives. We may have failed several times, either because we were in the right place at the wrong time or the wrong place at the right times. And these misalignments of our past may cause us to hesitate when God presents the right time in the right place for us to move forward. But these are the times in our lives when it would take courage to do what the God requires us to do. These are the time where the past doesn't give us a sense that it's going to work. Our present doesn't really show us that it's going to work. We have to trust God and have the courage to do what thus says the Lord. Now, courage is defined as having the mental and moral strength to venture persevere and withstand danger, fear, and difficulties. And we know that God has not given us the spirit of, of fear. So it takes us courage to jump when God tells us to jump, even when we cannot see the bottom. It takes courage for us to do some things that seem redundant in the past, useless and unfruitful in the past, and still do it because that's what God desires of us. God encourages us all throughout the Bible. As a matter of fact, if we look at Deuteronomy 31, 6, it says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified because of them. For the Lord, your God goes with you and he will never leave you nor forsake you. Or you can flip over to Joshua chapter one, verse nine, when God told Joshua once again, have I not commanded you be strong and courageous? Don't be afraid. Do not be discouraged for the Lord, your God will be with you wherever you go. Brothers and sisters, if that's you today and you feel like Obadiah in that you've been serving God and trusting God in your everyday life, but when it comes to certain tasks and certain things that God asks you to do that may take you out of your comfort zone or out of your boundaries, or in some cases may feel as though it may take you out of this world. God uh, is telling us here that we have to have courage, especially in those moments to still do what he command and he will take care of us. So what, regardless of the results of our obedience and whether we are allowed to wake up and see the sun S U N or the sun S O N God say he will never leave us nor forsake us. Moreover, he will be with us either way. Now, as we move on to verses 15 and 16, Elijah assures Obadiah of his intention, which gets Obadiah's attention to do what he's asking him to do. Verses 15 and 16 reads, but Elijah said, I swear by the Lord Almighty in whose presence I stand that I will present myself to Ahab this very day. Obadiah went to tell Ahab what Elijah, that Elijah had come and Ahab went out to meet Elijah. So here we find Elijah tell Obadiah that he's not there on his own behalf. He's there on the behalf of the one and only living God, the God that, 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 that have helped the Israelites from the beginning. The God in which the prophets that were serving him, Obadiah hid into the, the caves, two different caves. That's the God he comes representing or on behalf of at this point. As a matter of fact, Elijah, unlike Obadiah initially, shows courage to, to, to dare to come face to face with the man that has been looking for him for the past three years. Why does he dare come face to face with this king, the, the man that has been persecuting him for so long? I'm glad you asked. It's because he was doing what God told him to do. Elijah was acting in, in obedience to the word of God. Now, as we can see, sometimes, if not all the time, it will take courage to be obedient to the will of God. Sometimes we may not want to. Sometimes we may feel it's unsafe. But it takes courage, perseverance, 
even when we're fearful, even when it seems difficult to do the will of God, it takes courage. And that's what we find here today. So uh, um, Elijah kindly and wisely respond to Obadiah's legitimate fears, thereby assuring Obadiah that he will be right where he say he will be, not because he want to be, not because it's safe, not because it's, it's, it's going to be great, but because God told him what to do. So he, uh, Elijah is there. He's went and asked for the presence of the king. And now we find that um, Obadiah is obedient as well and go get the king. He finally agreed. Yep. In our last two verses, the king pays Elijah a visit. Verses 17 and 18 says, when Ahab saw him, he ex exclaimed, so is it really you, you troublemaker of Israel? I have made no trouble in Israel, Elijah replied. You and your family are the troublemakers, for you have refused to obey the commandments of the Lord and have worshipped images of Baal instead. So here, when we find Elijah and King Ahab come face to face, it's King Ahab that calls Elijah the troublemaker in Israel. Isn't that ironic? When the Lord um, calls Ahab the most evil of all kings prior in God's eyes, which is the only eyes that count when you think about it. Yet it's Ahab here that calls Elijah the troublemaker. That's weird because, okay, so what is a troublemaker then? Well, to Ahab, Elijah is the one who caused the drought that led to the famine in the land. And, and that he believed that Elijah somehow angered Baal, the, the sky god, and therefore Baal out of his anger withheld the rain. What type of God would verify the actions of someone who don't believe in him? Clearly, Elijah does not believe in some God called Baal. So why would Baal do what Elijah say he's going to do? It just doesn't make sense. Is Elijah is the one who told Ahab that there will be no dew or rain in this land until him under the provisions of God say so. Why would Baal agree to do what Elijah want him to do? It, it just makes no sense. But... You don't have to think about this too hard to see examples of this very thing today. God's promises throughout the Bible was that if we trust, obey, have faith in him and love him, he will protect us, love us and provide for us. But if we disobey him, we hate him and one another, worship other gods such as money, our children, our spouse or our house. He will allow sickness, disease, our enemies to take our land. There will be no peace and no joy. And moreover, we will suffer from a spiritual death. So when God reacts to our actions, we want to blame him for all types of things. And we'll say, what type of God would allow these things to happen? I'll tell you what type of God would allow these things to happen. A God that keeps his promises. A God that will, will love you and do everything he can for you, but requires you to worship him, requires you to praise him, and moreover, requires you to trust and believe in him, and as well as obey. Elijah also shows us that there's something, uh, sometimes because of our belief, others are going to look at us like we're the troublemakers for standing for things that God stands for and not standing for the things that God does not stand for. So they would go around calling us the troublemakers. Oh, oh, they won't say troublemakers. They'll call us, oh, you're old school. Oh, you're single-minded or narrow-mindedness. You're, you're uh, anti-social. You're unhip to the current environment. Or oh, you're a liberal. I tell you what, if calling all of us these things, troublemakers and unhip to current environments or liberal, if that means that we are walking in the will of God, so what? They can say whatever they want about us. But here we find Elijah responds with Ahab. It was priceless because it was truthful. He boldly and courageously told the king that the nation's calamities can be traced uh, tra is traceable chiefly to the king himself and his family's support and practice of idolatry. Indeed, God promised in Deuteronomy that he would cause a drought if evil prevailed in the land. If they worship Baal or any other god, God promised droughts. He promised that they would not be fruitful in the land. In other words, 
they brought it upon themselves by worshiping these false gods. See, we can't blame God for keeping his promises in reaction to our sinful actions. God forgives. God will free our land as we repent from our sins. But there are some times, there are some things that even though God forgive our sins, we still have to live with the consequences of the sin while we're here on earth. Uh, we may have eternal life with God, but brothers and sisters, there are things that we do here on earth and sins that we commit that God forgives us and promise that we will live with him forever. But we may have to serve out a life sentence. We may have to go to jail. We may lose that wife or that husband. With that, that child may not ever um, come back and want to be in our lives. They may be the consequences of our sins. But as long as we have Christ in our lives, then we will be okay. Elijah's courage, his, his faith in God shows the Israelites back then and it shows us right now that what may seem impossible to man is possible with God because all things are possible with God. So we have to have the courage to, to, to see things with our spiritual eyes before we're able to see it with our physical eyes. We have to have the courage to, to take the victory that God has already won. We have to have the courage to walk the path that God has already cleared for us. Brothers and sisters, I pray for each and every one of you that you have the courage to walk out your, your salvation the way that Jesus has already done. Amen. Brothers and sisters, that concludes our lesson for this week. Don't forget to leave us a, a like and a comment and let us know what you think. So until next week, may God bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine his face upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Goodbye.